All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Williams. I'm the Access Fellow at Jesus College at the University of Oxford and here to run another mock interview with I'm Lucy McBride. Um, I'm a third year history student at Jesus College. I'm currently the JCL Access Rep and I'm from Gateshead in the Northeast, which I don't know, I'd be surprised if that many of you had heard of it. Particularly at Oxford, we're a very underrepresented group. And uh, I was, I think, the first person from my school to go to either Oxford or Cambridge. So my story when I was applying was very much trial and error. You know, I wasn't very aware of the deadlines, I wasn't aware of the uh, admissions tests, and I had no idea what an interview would entail, which is partly my motivation for participating in today's mock interview, to kind of try and demystify the process. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Lucy's been terrific at helping in our access work, so I'm really grateful to her for that. So we are going to now try a mock interview uh, for history. So just to get the ball rolling, Lucy, just like to explain that in the UK, in England specifically, we educate children in key stage one in history and key stage one is the ages of five to seven. Now my question for you is, if you were to design a history course for primary school children of the ages of five to seven, what sort of design principles do you think you would apply? As in, what would I put on the curriculum and what format it would take? Absolutely, yeah. So you can tell me about what substance, what sort of particular topics, how you would like to present those topics, what sort of skills you'd like to develop. Just tell me a little okay. bit about how history can be taught to very young children. Okay, that's interesting. That's actually very topical at the minute, isn't it? Because there's been so much in the news about curriculum reform uh, and the kind of role history has in uh, education and society. Um, I think... For me, one of the most important things when teaching history is um, making sure that we don't just focus on a particular demographic. And um, so, so far in history, it's kind of been corrected now by um, advances in the discipline and stuff, but there's been a tendency in the past to kind of focus on powerful white man history has been very eurocentric it's been very focused on western europe um so i think from an early age it would be really really useful for um children to see that you know history is about people like them um people from a variety of backgrounds people from a variety of different social structures mm. uh, from social classes sorry um so i think making sure there was as broad a variety on the curriculum as possible. Um, hmm. well, Just on that point, so the word course, when we talk about history course or history syllabus, implies a degree mm -hmm. of coherence to it. And especially yeah. with young children, the risk is that if you try and go broad, it might become quite confusing. So how do you think you could balance off those two? Hmm. I think it is important when you're younger um, to develop a kind of sense of chronology in history. I think that's quite useful. Um, obviously, if you try and teach Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2, kind of everything from ancient Egypt to World War II, which is kind of where the lines are drawn, um, that in itself, just the need to cover so much kind of chronology limits the depth that you can go into and the breadth you can take. But I, I do think that within each of those areas, like if you do the Romans, the Middle Ages and stuff, it's important to have a, as much variety in those categories as possible. Hmm. Yeah, good. But what do you mean by a sense of chronology? That's an interesting term. Um, I think because particularly when you study history later on, uh, and not even just in an academic sense, this is actually a valuable thing in the broader world. It's, uh, it's good to get a sense of change over time. And that doesn't necessarily mean progress over time as well. I think it needs to be made apparent that um, as, as like other advances are made, it doesn't necessarily mean like humanity is progressing in a in a linear kind of way. Um, and I also think, yeah, so to kind of illustrate change over time and then the mechanisms for change over time as well, that comes through if you teach history in a chronological order. 
Good, and that sentience, that sense of chronology implies a skills development as well. So what sort of skills do you think that history brings to potentially young children that other subjects that they would be studying may not? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, hmm. I think at a young age, even at a young age, it's uh, perhaps not the most important skill, but something that definitely is very applicable in kind of any walk of life is the ability to kind of look at sources critically mm -hmm. um, and understand kind of potential bias and the concept of objectivity. And it sounds probably a bit much for children, but you can do it in a, in a fun way, like ask them questions like, who wrote this? Why do you think they wrote that? And I think that's useful because especially like in the age of like fake news and and everything there's so much uncertainty as to whether what you read is remotely factually true it's a skill that anybody could use and i think history is particularly good for helping you develop that skill okay terrific what are some of the risks that that may that, that we may encounter in developing a curriculum a history curriculum for such young children um Perhaps not a, a risk, but one thing that uh, I think needs to be like emphasized is that it needs to be fun and engaging. Um, so many people have said when I tell them what degree I do, I get like very mixed reviews and it's always either, oh, I loved history. I had such a good teacher. They really brought it to life. Or people say, oh, it was so boring. It's just like copying out notes and dates from a book and stuff. So I, I think really the risk, the risk is to like, you don't want to make it really dry and boring for children because that can deter them for ages. Okay, terrific. And uh, let's, I mean, let's focus on the verb to design. If a state, a government is designing history, that could almost have terrifying implications, could it not? Especially on yeah. such questionable minds. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think history is always the first port of call, port, <laughs> port of call for um, like propaganda. Anytime anyone tries to be persuasive, they like to kind of invoke historical images. And we've seen actually like with uh, topics such as imperialism, mm -hmm. it's been taught in such a way that's presented an extremely warped view, which is incredibly dangerous. So in terms of the practicalities of design, I think it would definitely have to like it couldn't just come from one particular government. There'd have to be many different kind of bodies consulted and academics, professionals in education and history. So I suppose linking back to what you said previously about a sense of chronology, whose sense of chronology are you trying to impart? Is there, is there a sense of chronology, an objective sense that we could all access provided we study hard enough? Or... Is history often just an imposed sense of chronology from people in power? And hence, as you say, why we often tend to focus on particular characters and particular time frames. That even whether we're talking about very young children or yourself, third year finalist at Oxford University, you're not learning a sense of chronology, you're, lear you're learning somebody's sense of chronology. Um, do you mean in terms of like, like a Western centric? way of defining chronology or so possibly so perhaps i'm getting more to the sense of what even is history and that the Ooh. possibility is that history is narrative formation and it doesn't mm. matter whether we're talking about five-year-olds or 25-year-olds yeah you're still especially if you're designing a syllabus designing mm. a way for people to see the world in your in terms that you think are favorable mm -hmm. but essentially you're right um designing a curriculum is like designing a long story if you go down the chronological route with a implicitly a beginning middle and end um and i suppose different interpretations of that would come from different people with different motives uh, yeah. so let me let me just read well in fact I'll, I'll share my screen and i'll show you what the actual Department of Education uh, document says so that you can see it yourself. I'm going to read the first two aims and I'd just like you to just tell me 
what you think of these. So the National Curriculum for History, and this is for key stages one and two, so ages five to 11. Uh, the National Curriculum aims to ensure that all pupils know and understand the history of these islands as a coherent chronological narrative from the earliest times to the present day, how people's lives have shaped this nation and how Britain has influenced and been influenced by the wider world. They should also know and understand significant aspects of the history of the wider world, the nature of ancient civilizations, the expansion and dissolution of empires, characteristic features of past non-European societies, achievements and follies of mankind. So what do you think about those aims? Um, I think an understanding of um, Britain for British school children is very important. Um, I think what isn't explicit there is that like there's a tendency to have like if you teach in the history of Britain a very like jingoistic nationalistic kind of rose tinted view of Britain um I think it's important for children to kind of see the good and the bad um because otherwise it doesn't really make much sense you're not really presented with a very full picture of so how kind of today's society has emerged so where in these, in these, in those two short paragraphs, can you see a potential risk towards that jingoism, that nationalism? Can you still see them? Yeah, I'm just rereading them. I think um, how Britain has influenced and been influenced by the wider world um, definitely conjures up either the image of like history of wars and also history of empire and i always think they're the areas where there's a tendency to present a very um jingoistic or even like white saviory kind of complex <laughs> vision of britain so i think i can see a risk there and then also um to know and understand significant aspects of the history of the wider world sometimes i think eras from world history are taken out of context um mm. like i'm not sure i think sometimes if you study just one aspect of german history for example that could like lead you to have like a warped view of that nation's past and everything so i think putting things in context when dealing with world history is also really important yeah, I'm really pleased you picked up on significant aspects of the history of the wider world. Mm -hmm. Who's identifying these significant aspects? Yeah, exactly. It's significant in what way? Is it significant in that it reinforces the uh, the first bullet point in the narrative of Britain? Mm -hmm. Or significant in that it has actual educational value to <laughs> children and relevance to today? Well, and the Department for Education suggests that significant aspects include the following, ancient civilizations and the expansion and dissolution of empires. So what sort of message is that giving to five to seven year olds about significance in history? Hmm. Well, particularly the expansion and dissolution of empires kind of implies that other territories are only relevant or significant when in the context of empire and conquest. And then um, ancient civilizations as well also kind of relates to what I said earlier about taking things out of context like yeah. like the if people think of Egypt they think of like mummies and tombs and pyramids and stuff whereas the, obviously that region has a very rich history that has run parallel with the history of Britain but this is what I mean by things being kind of just yeah. picked and chosen to kind of augment and support and contrast with British history. Right, and we're also therefore giving children not only a concept of chronology, but also a concept of civility and civilization. Mm -hmm. Education being that we are amongst the civilized world and that they ought to yeah. identify barbarism and yeah. think less of it. So, yeah. I mean, I suppose it doesn't much matter what history syllabus we come up with, there are going to be certain risks of these potential biases. So it's yeah. one of the indications that we simply shouldn't teach history. It's far too dangerous to teach history to such young, impressionable minds. Um, I mean, of course, I think I'd be <laughs> inclined to disagree with that. I think there's risks, but there's the risks in teaching like many of the uh, art subjects because there's always the risk for bias. There's always the risk for people to um, 
manipulate subjects to their kind of to further their own ends, especially where like young children are concerned. Um, I would definitely say the benefits of <laughs> teaching history outweigh um, if the risks are if like proper steps are taken to address the risks, then the benefits of teaching history definitely outweigh the uh, potential for misuse. So what, what sort of counterfactual universe are you imagining? Let's say we did scrap history education until young people were teenagers. What sort of loss of development would you anticipate in those teenagers that have been starved of historical education? Um, hmm. I think, I don't know, children's favorite question is often why, and I think they'd miss out on quite a lot of explanation for why the world that they live in is the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And even just on a smaller scale, kind of relating to older generations and understanding the significance of certain things in their lives, I think they'd miss out on that. Okay, terrific, great. Thank you so much, Lucy, that was Thank you. great. Uh, how are you feeling? How did you feel that? Oh, it was like a, uh, a flashback to <laughs> years ago, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh. but you, did, you did very well. So uh, you. nice focus on the questions. Uh, you developed your analysis. You pulled back to various points you'd made earlier, and I encourage you to do that as well. Mm -hmm. We focused on some specific concepts and took them a bit further and deeper. Yeah. Your notion of a sense of chronology, I thought, was really fascinating. And it was a bridge between the substantive and the methodological side of history, I felt. But it's not only yeah. what do we study in history, but how do we do history? I suppose, as is often the case in history interviews, there's this sort of hidden subtextual question of what on earth is history? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I was kind of dr dragging you towards that. And, yeah. uh, and you know, and and you you got there really really well and really quickly. But that's commonly the subtext in these questions: is that you know, what is history? What are historians? Is there some sort of potential risk in studying history? Yeah. Uh, but no, I thought I thought you did really well. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you. For being a <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and terrific. Yeah. So thanks again. Oh, thank you very much.